welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am joined by Kevin Graham who is on the other end of the line as we are in isolation and recording remotely and we are going to be speaking about Screamer Celica. So before we go any further, for anyone who hasn't read any of the Screamer Celica features, Kevin, tell us what is that feature on the Axon website that you write? Basically... Screamer Celica articles is when I look at an album and look at how Celtic were doing at that time. Um, the first album that I looked at, obviously, was the album that gave the feature its name. And we looked at the game against Ekerin, um for yeah. those, those of you that remember that. So what I just do, I have a look through maybe the greatest album lists of the years and pick an album that jumps out to me and I have a look to see what was happening in the Celtic world at that time. It's that simple really. It, it is simple but I think it's a great feature. It's a great feature and of course what you're doing is you're going through periods of time that may have been pivotal in your own life but it's one of these things as well. You can go back, you can do it retrospectively. We could be picking albums from the 60s, from the 70s and, and the 80s and then looking at what was happening in the world of Celtic at that time. You mentioned Screamadelica and the feature that you that you wrote at that time, you know, during that period, Celtic were in disarray. And the album that we're going to be talking about mainly today, Celtic, again, were in a completely different type of disarray. So tell me first and foremost, Kevin, what is the artist and what is the album? The album is by a Manchester band called Doves and it's called Lost Souls. Now, this was released on the 3rd of April 2000 and it's very difficult during this period not to think or go back to the 8th of February 2000 when we lost Inverness Cali. So the club is in a bit of a turmoil at that point. John Barnes is promptly sacked after the Inverness game and Kenny Dugleish then takes charge with mixed results. And this period when this album came out, we are getting mixed results at, the, at this point. Obviously, th- there's... There's also a lot of speculation at this time who's going to be the manager in the summer. And when you look back over the, the press cuttings, I mean, hindsight tells you that Douglas didn't want the job. But when you look back at the press cuttings at that time, Douglas is still saying he might be interested. It could be he, he's, he's saying that he took Blackburn for a first division team and made them English Premier League champions. So he's still talking himself up. But yeah. We, we a lot of things. Hindsight tells you that he never wanted the job. Stories come out after it saying he wasn't interested in doing the job full time. And during that period as well, I mean, we won our first trophy of the, 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 the new decade under Douglas. Yeah. And I think a lot of folk actually forget that. But it was, it was a really traumatic time. We were beat twice by Rangers. We got gubbed 4 nothing at Ibrox in one of the games, but we won the League Cup. So it's strange. Again, we're looking back. And looking back now, you're going, ah, that was fine because we know what happened on the 1st of June. We appointed Martin O'Neill and everything's been fine since then. Yeah. I mean, what we'll start off with is we'll start off with, with Celtic's lost souls and then we'll move on to the Manchester lost souls of the Doves. And it's incredible there when you give the release date that we're approaching 20 years since the release of that album. And we'll talk about the album and also the musical landscape around about 2000 as well. So the Celtic situation at that time was we were sold this idea that Celtic had a dream team, a management dream team. And Kenny Dalglish, who for all intents and purposes was the director of football, I don't know if that was the exact title he was given, it was something along those lines, football operations. And John Barnes was the head coach. Dalglish told us that Barnes was potentially one of the finest coaches in Europe at that time. This was his first appointment. And I remember thinking back to the other chap who was a fantastic footballer, whose first managerial appointment was at Celtic Park, and it was Liam Brady. Uh, both managers were given a lot of money, Kevin. I mean, under Barnes's tutelage, Celtic brought in a lot of players for big, big money. And one of those players that I think will always be remembered for the Barnes and Dalglish era is Raphael Scheidt, the Brazilian, who came in for over £5 million. 
It's turned into a ridiculous signing. What's your memories of Raphael? He actually made his debut just a couple of weeks after Barnes was sacked. What's your memories of Raphael? Truthfully, no very much. <laughs> um, he didn't play that many games for us because if my memory's correct, he sort of got injured right away. He came mm. on, he made his debut against Dundee as a sub. Would I, would I be right in saying that? He did. Celtic won 6-2 that, that six, day. 6-2. Six, yep. He always looked... Out of shape, he always he had. For what I can remember, he, he had a strange body shape, and he, he looked like the side of a wardrobe. There didn't seem to be many chiselled features that you would see. You look at Oliver Talibli at that time as well. He was a machine. He, he was muscle bound. But when you when you when you saw Raphael, mm-hmm. he just seemed like a block. He seemed like a brick. Obviously, there's a bit of dubiety about how he ever became a professional footballer there's definitely dubiety about how he managed it how he managed to end up at Celtic the the Brazilian manager at that time I think was found guilty of taking bribes for capping players the agents wanted to sell to Europe I think there was loads of agents involved to bring him to Celtic John Cahoon being one of them seemingly but again at, at this time, Rangers had spent a lot of money at that time. And we, we were always looking to spend money to be the answer. And Raphael was just one of those many moonbeams that will have been sold over the years, especially during the late 90s. Raphael was just many a list of player who we bought for big money, but just couldn't handle playing for Celtic. But what it seems to be Raphael, he just didn't have the ability to play for Celtic. But even though, I mean, there, there, is, a, there is a famous example of a, a, a guy in Brazilian football who made a career as a professional football player and never kicked a ball. He, he, mm-hmm. there, was a, there was a film released about him last year. So there seems to be, look, foot, football in South America... We were, I was lucky enough to watch the Diego Maradona documentary that you mentioned by Luke yeah. Massey um, in the previous podcast. I watched that on Saturday night when it was on and football was a way out of poverty and there's a lot of people make a lot of money, basically player trafficking and it's maybe hard not to think that Raphael was just part of a, a bigger scam and he somehow ended up at Celtic. There was a, a commercial element, not from Celtic Football Club, but obviously from the Brazilian national team and Nike, because there was a contract whereby Brazil were playing a lot more games than would be expected of an international team. And what happened as a result of that is they had a huge pool of players who were getting one or two caps. They were handing out caps to players who ordinarily would not play for Brazil. And uh, Rafael got a few caps and obviously his value increased as a result of that. Two stories that I always go back to when I'm thinking back to Rafael, our Brazilian, is first and foremost, we spoke to Bobby Petter and Bobby said that Rafael was not shite. He was actually a a very accomplished player at training. He had the technique, he had skills. But again, at that level, you would expect everybody to have a level of ability, Kevin. And when it's Celtic, when it's a top club, And when you're in disarray, as we certainly were, around about the time that he made his debut, it's going to be difficult for for players like him to come through. I remember Stan Petrov not looking the greatest player when he first came in, played out of position, unfit, bit tubby, and he was learning the language, he was learning the culture of Scotland. So I'm not comparing Raphael to Stan Petrov. We all know what Petrov went on to achieve. The second story, and I think I might have mentioned this on the podcast once or twice, is Martin O'Neill at one of his first training sessions, is standing at the side of a training pitch with Tommy Burns, God rest his soul. And he points out the Brazilian and asks, who's that, Tommy? And Tommy says, that's Rafael Scheidt. He says, well, you can take his squad number and give it to me because there's more chance of me playing for Celtic than he will. And strangely enough, Martin O'Neill then had a squad number in number 31, which was Rafael's. It might be a coincidence, but I like the myth better than the truth sometimes. And uh, I'll go with that story, Kevin. And I think Martin O'Neill probably would have performed better than Raphael. The other thing I was going to say is the Inverness game, which we remember for all the wrong reasons. Leading up to that, we'd come back from the, the uh, winter break in Portugal and there was a string of results, a draw away at Rugby Park, followed by a home defeat to Hearts. Leading up to this cup match in the Scottish Cup, which was, it was actually delayed. It was postponed due to some stadium issues at the time. 
and uh, obviously we went out and we we were beaten. And that was after throwing away a two-goal lead against Hearts. So there were issues behind the scenes. Having spoken to a few of the players who later were part of the Vim Janssen side, they said that John Barnes never really integrated himself with the playing staff. Have you heard anything along those lines, Kevin? I think it's quite obvious that was the case. I mean, the game that you speak, you spoke about there, when we were 2 nothing up against Hearts and got beat 3-2, Colin Cameron scored the winning penalty kick, actually. I don't know why I remember Colin Cameron scoring the, the winning penalty kick, but I do. We signed a lot of players from the English Premiership. We signed Berkovic and, I mean... It's very difficult because you're not you're not privy, you're not on the inside. But you've got John Barnes, one of the greatest footballers ever, coming to a club who his first job coming to a club and trying to implement a style of football which is maybe alien to the Scottish game. Mm-hmm. And trying to implement that I mean what we've got to remember here is the first ten games were undefeated and the yeah. opening the open game of that season at uh, Aberdeen was utterly we were, we were devastating that day. But even when we were even when we were winning, there was always rumours that the squad weren't happy. They weren't getting on with each other. The tactics were eventually going to get found out. And I think us as a support even had that uh, in the back of our minds. The day that we got beat against Dundee United, we lost two one at Tanadice. And to put this into context. This it's a it's a Sunday night. It's a it's a glorious Sunday night. I remember it. The sun was splitting. This the the sun was splitting the trees. Mm-hmm. We've we've went ten games un, unbeaten, and we go to Tanadice, and we lose at Tanadice, and it's a difficult venue to go to as Tanadice. So you would think, as a support, we would react the way that you would react if it's your first defeat in that league season. We didn't yeah. react that we, we didn't react that way. There was running battles outside the stadium. There was supporters fighting with each other. It was almost as if we knew this is it. The house of cards has now fell. The house of cards is now mm-hmm. gone. And mm-hmm. without actually looking back over the press coverage at the time, it could have been because the press were building up, building up, building up, building up that there's problems here. There's problems, and as soon as one, as soon as that defeat hit us, we were like that. Oh no, there is problems here. Everything is going to go pear shaped, and you move on about six, seven weeks after that defeat. You've got that horrible night in Leon as well, which mm-hmm. I think any hope that John Barnes had of being a success as a ma- as a manager disappeared that night. I mean, Henrik was talismanic at that point as well. And you just have to have a look at the team that we had at that point. Now I've got the the league cup the the league the league cup final team and goals is Jonathan Gould who did play a part in Matt O'Neill the following year, Vida Rousseff, yeah. Johan Mialbe, Tom Boyd, Jackie Mack, Petrov Maravchik, Morton Weekhorst, Stefan Maye, Vaduka and uh, Tommy Johnson and Berkovic came on in the uh, in the ninetieth minute. There's mm-hmm. still there's still a core of those players went on and won the treble the following season. It's not as if you you're dealing with like bad footballers. You just needed footballers who needed pushed in the right direction. And the fact that O'Neill came in and even though he was a, a genius, the fact is he turned a club round that quick points to me as well. There was problems behind the scenes. And we can maybe point to uh, a more recent version, Ronnie Dyla, the step up for Ronnie Dyla to Brendan Rodgers. When we know that some of the squad didn't buy into Ronnie Dyla, then since that point we haven't lost a, a trophy. No, I think all of the points you make are absolutely key to the downfall of John Barnes. The story that I remember, I've already mentioned, the winter break to Portugal, when they were over there, Tommy Johnson and a group of guys were around a table in a cafe and they were having a soft drink. Now, they were drinking lemonade and John Barnes walked into the cafe, walked right over to the table and picked up Tommy Johnson's glass and actually tasted it to make sure that they weren't drinking vodka or gin or whatever it may have been. And I think at that point, the players, according to Tommy himself, looked at each other and thought, you know, this guy is treating us like children. And I think there is mutiny in a camp such as that. These are highly paid footballers. There are egos all over the changing room. 
And all it takes is that that one person to come in, uh, i.e. John Barnes, who had the same size of ego, and then there's a clash, you know. So that that's the one thing that springs to my mind. Going back to some of the earlier performances under John Barnes, he opened the season up at Petaudry and won 5-0. Um, I always remember taking an Aberdeen back to Celtic Park and beating them 7-0. And that result was quite incredible, but it was followed up with the night in Lyon, you know. So on the one hand, you're beating Aberdeen 7 nothing, and Celtic are imperious at that point. And, and again, you only have to look at the kind of forward line to, or even the goal scorers that day. Berkovic, Larson, Viduka. Berkovic, Larson and Viduka. Behind them, you've got Maravchik, you know. So in terms of flair and crafting teams open, uh, that team had that in abundance. But if you've got mutiny and you've got your superstar player, who is on a long-term injury list, you're up against it. We ended the year, 1999, with a draw against Rangers. And, you know, that was on the back of another 6 nothing win against Aberdeen at Putaudry and beating Dundee United 4-1 at home. So it did look as though there was the makings of a team. But the minute you've got mutiny in the camp, Kevin, when, it, when you add the egos into that, it's quite easy for a manager to lose the dressing room. And I think that's what happened with John Barnes. On the night in question, I recently found out it was the same night that young Declan McConville was born, who is a and a contributor to a Celtic state of mind. That was the night he was born, the 8th of February. It was also future superstars, uh, Kevin Maguire's first game at Celtic Park. It was. You know, I remember him speaking about that. And then in comes Dalgleish. And what you saw is that Dalgleish started bleeding in quite a lot of the younger players. He realised that uh, we were out of the, the league title race and he started bleeding in some of the young guys that came in. John Kennedy, the pick of the bunch, really. But also we had Simon Simon Lynch and uh, several others came in. I do remember the final game of the season against Dundee United and I remember Henrik Larson's moustache that day and thankfully there was some footage on Twitter recently which proved that my memory isn't playing tricks on me. He had a terrible moustache. It was like the guy from Sparks. And um, Celtic really were in disarray. And I think at that time, I didn't want Dalglish to get the job permanently. What was your thoughts at the time, Kevin? Even though we were able to win a cup that season, I didn't want Dalglish to come back as a manager. I think I blamed him as much as John Barnes in many ways. I think that whole period, Dalglish... Should has to take most of the blame as well because if rumours are to be believed he was never there the night of the Inverness defeat he was he was in Malaga playing golf I was meant to be he was meant to be on a scouting mission to a youth tournament similarly but he's in Malaga playing golf Douglas should have been there more for John Barnes knowing full well that he's under pressure he's got he's got a dressing room with two difficult characters in Berkovic and Mark Viduka now Viduka's all even before Barnes arrived Viduka had went on strike and didn't and didn't appear from the moment he, from the moment he turned up in Scotland for all his undoubted talent he was always looking for a way out it was it was always rumored that he was he was always looking for his next move and you've got Berkovic as well again another highly talented footballer but but a wee prickly character by all accounts I mean when Kenny Douglas took over what was noticeable what he done is he made us absolute terrible to watch he became the he became the exact opposite of what John Barnes was trying to do. There were some yeah. games when there was there were some games when Alan Stubbs was playing in the centre midfield. I remember he played in the centre midfield in the League Cup semi final against Kilmarnock. There was games where he played six defenders on the pitch. He just seemed to want to toughen the team up, make them difficult to beat, and it was a turgid watch. And a, a bit like yourself. I was probably not in favour of him getting the job. He just always looked crabby. Eh? It just always looked like he didn't want to be there. Then you've got the whole. He didn't look as though he was enjoying it. No. Then you've got the whole. I lead up to we got beat off Rangers one nothing at Celtic Park. We lost a late goal. We actually played well that day, and that left us twelve points behind with twelve games to go. 
Now, the paper says that was a title done and dusted. There's a dozen games left in your 12 points. Why they're not saying that now right enough, but that's a completely and utterly different story. But they, they say that was a title finish. As soon as Rod Wallace scored that late winner, that was a title gone. So the week after the League Cup final, we had the infamous Baird's Bar press conference before we went to Ibrox on the Saturday. At that point, we're a joke. I mean, we've just won our first trophy of the millennium. It wasn't a very good game, but it's still a trophy. The players enjoyed it. The fans that day enjoyed it. We still celebrated the first trophy of the millennium. Then within four days, we're having a press conference in a pub before going to Ibrox. Do you think this was Kenny Dalglish's attempt at saying that we're all in this together? The the fans, the players, the management, we're all in this together. Was that his thinly veiled attempt to, to do that? If it was, it was misguided. It just made him look petty in the eyes of the press. And after that, he didn't have a, didn't stand a chance with the press in Scotland. Because everybody just remembers the Bears Bar one, but I'm sure there was one in the Celtic Supporters Association as well on the London Road a couple of weeks after it. So what would have got us all in together would be playing good football and winning games. To have a press conference in Bears Bar, then go out the following day and get absolutely moored at Ibrox for nothing. Mm-hmm. You're not going to win any friends or influence people with results like that and behaviour like like that it just it just highlights the the negative of taking a press conference to a pub to basically annoy people personally looking back that's what it seems the press were giving him a hard time and he just says i'm going to make this as completely awkward and uncomfortable for you as possible you and i both really enjoyed kenny douglas's last documentary because it gave you an insight into the way of kenny's thinking in relation to the press and how he has himself been described as a prickly character with the press. And when you watch that, if you didn't already know, you understand why. Because the press basically treated him and his people, his people being uh, the Liverpool fans, atrociously. And I think, obviously, Kenny Dalglish has carried that on, that contempt. And it's it's absolutely understandable why he would do that, particularly to some of the news outlets who, to this day, uh, aren't worth the paper they're, they're printed on. We won't even mention them. So when you're looking at that, that particular period... Kevin, we won't move into the era of Martin O'Neill. That that is perhaps for another podcast and another Screamer Celica. Let's have a look at some of the the albums that were coming out around about that time. I'm going to run through a few and just throw them at you. You don't know the albums I'm going to be mentioning here. You may or may not be a big fan of some of these some of these artists, but we had Gorky's Zychotic Monkey releasing the Blue Tree. Were you a big fan of Gorky's? I can't say I was a big fan, but I can say that I saw them live. It would have been a few years before that, and they supported Spiritualised at the Glasgow Garage. So, Euro Childs, that was that was his name, eh? That, that was his... That, that was a guy... Euro Childs, yeah. That, that, that He's was now at the guy. Teenage Fan Club. Is he? He's now a member of the Teenage Fan Club, yeah. Wow. Euro Childs. Wow, I didn't think that. <laughs> Um, there you go. Welsh bands. I was more a super furry animals man. Um, I love the I love the super furry animals as well. Going back to beards, I remember seeing them at the bars, and uh, every time I went to the bars, it involved a, a trip to the beards bar. And uh, the super furries you brought them up. They also released their Welsh language album. I think it's pronounced Ming. That's correct. Yes. Can you remember that? I do, yeah. It's a, it's a good Some album. great tunes on that. <laughs> it's a good oh, brilliant album. album. Eh? Uh, the Super Furries, I don't think I've made many wrong steps in their career. I, I really don't. There's no many bad albums that they've, that they've made. And Grief Reese, his solo stuff is always quality as well. My memory, again, of the Super Furries is they did a single with Mogwai. They done a single with, with Mogwai. I don't know if you can remember this. And during the film of the actual video on the Mogwai drum kit there's a Celtic scarf and all that can you remember this, the single? I don't, I don't I'm, I'm, I'm trying I'm trying to frantically jog my memory here the guy who did the live sound for Super Furry Animals was Michael Brennan Jr okay and Michael Brennan Jr was also the producer of the Super Furry Animals album Gorilla and he had a recording studio called Substation in Cowden Beath of all places, Cowden Beath. It's now in Rosyth and Fife, and him and his dad uh, ran that studio. Now, it was him that put the Furries and Mogwai in the same room together. He certainly organised that, and they released a, a single. And check it out on YouTube, right? The single is called Dial Revenge. YouTube it. 
watch know, the video. It's a soon, black and white. Uh, as soon as you've said that, I, I can what it is. But <laughs> it used to be on M two. Remember M two, MTV two when it when it launched around about that time. Yes, the yes, single I, was on there constantly, and I just love the fact I'm always looking for tenuous Celtic links so that I can get people on the podcast. So the Super Furry Animals passed that test because they were in a video with Mogwai and there was an appearance of a Celtic scarf. So. That's the Super Furry Animals, who I loved. I'm going to throw in a, a low bowler for you, because I went to see this artist live at Earl's Court this year, Madonna. She released an album called Music. That that was the kind of techno one. Who was a producer on it? A big big dance producer. Can't remember his name. Was it Jack LeConte? No. There was actually a number of producers on that album, including Mirwai and William Orbit, Orbit. Mike Stent, Talvin Singh. So there was quite a few. But she did, she did work with... Uh, Jack LeConte as well because he performed live when I went to see her and by the way I'm not a big Madonna fan right but I would go to see Madonna I would go to see Beyonce I would go and see Rihanna I would go just for the the live experience Kevin rather than being a mad fan of these people right so I did go down uh, to to uh, experience that and to be fair it was it was a fantastic gig I, I went to see uh, Lauren Hill as well my wife's a big fan and so when she played at the the hydro but she was fantastic as well great entertainer fantastic voice brilliant voice it's worth going to see just for the show uh, some of the other some of the other artists who were releasing albums david holmes a lot of people probably got to know david holmes through his work with noel gallagher but he released bow down to the exit sign this year Good and album. i remember a band called asian dub foundation uh, they released community music and Bobby Gillespie was a big fan of Asian Dub Foundation because they did a, a single, Free Sat Pal Ram. Remember the sing- single yes. they did? I have a story about me meeting Asian Dub Foundation after the Glasgow Green Festival. So the, the Glasgow Green Festival was at the weekend in August 2000 and we were playing Rangers on the Sunday and it's a, f- a famous game. And so we were staying in Glasgow that night, me and, me and my wife were staying in Glasgow that night. And on the morning of the game, we went down to have breakfast in the, in the hotel that we were in. And we had breakfast with Asian Dub Foundation. And I think, um, my wife would maybe tell me better, but I think I completely burnt the lugs off him talking about the primal scream and Celtic. And because I remember, I, I, I remember the conversation that I had with him. Was he was asking me about the rivalry between Celtic and Rangers, and he did mention right. uh, that he, he did he did mention that um, they obviously they toured with the Primal Scream, they made records with the Primal Scream, that they were more Celtic minded because of the influence of the Primal Scream. So that that's Brilliant. my story. How can we get Asian Dove Foundation on the podcast? They'd be a great guest, wouldn't they? Then he then he mentioned that they had breakfast with a hungover guy <laughs> twenty year ago. <laughs> In a Glasgow hotel. I'm going to I'm going to see what they're up to these days. We also had Paul Weller releasing Heliocentric, an album that was toured uh, with Edgar Summertime on the bass guitar. Some fantastic live performances with a friend of the podcast, Edgar Summertime, playing bass. Are you a big Weller fan? Not particularly, no. Um, it's not... Again, he's one of those artists that just seems to have so much work to get through, especially in his later years. He just seems to be prolific at producing albums. Obviously, everybody likes a jam. Everybody's got a jam's greatest hits in their collection. I actually do quite like some of the Style Council stuff that I've heard as well. But I'm not a massive Weller fan, truthfully. I understand his place in the, the rock lineage of... British music and his influence is there for anybody that picks up a guitar now. But there, there is a Paul Weller influence, especially in a, a lot of a lot of acts that you do see now. Eh? So understand, it's a bit like Bowie. I was never a Bowie fan, but I understand what they've done for British music and the reason that they've got this this stature as being gods. Another couple of Scottish bands that released albums that year were. Bell and Sebastian and the Delgados. The Delgados released The Great Eastern, which was an album I was very fond of at the time. Bell and Sebastian, Fold Your Hands, Child, You Walk Like a Peasant. I always remember thinking when I first seen the advert that it was called Fold Your Hands, Child, You Walk Like a Pheasant. And I thought that, that was a better title. I thought that was a better album title. Are you a fan of Bell and Sebastian, The Delgados? Love both bands. Uh, the Great Eastern was probably... After Exterminator was probably my favourite album of that year. 
obviously I'm working on a project at the at the moment where I'm looking at that that time. So I've actually got that album on quite a bit now, and it's aged really really well. It's it's a really it's still. Sometimes when you go back and revisit stuff in your mind, especially from that late 90s time, there was a lot of bands that you thought were superb at that late 90s time. And when you go back and listen to the stuff, you're like, wait a minute, that, that hasn't that hasn't uh, aged well. But that, Disney that stand album, up. Uh, that, the Great Eastern has aged really, really well. And the Bell, the Bell and Sebastian stuff is also timeless as well. Again... What is it with Scotland? They seem to produce magnificent bands who have got longevity and they just keep on going, eh? Yeah, and when, when I'm looking down the list of some of the albums, you were talking about Scottish bands, we've already mentioned them, but Teenage Fan Club released their Howdy album. It was the last album that featured another friend of the podcast, Mr Paul Quinn, if Paul's listening. A big shout out to Paul. Paul, if he's listening. I uh, hope you're well. And Paul made his final appearance in the studio on the Teenage Fan Club album, Howdy, which I think was a fantastic LP. And I think that it went under the radar to a degree. So, Howdy, we've already spoken about that one, Kevin. We felt it was a very underrated album when you look at the discography of Teenage Fan Club. It, it definitely is. I think a lot of the Teenage Fan Club stuff, especially when you start getting into the year 2000, musical preferences begun begun to change. I think you, you then start seeing the, the influence of the internet at that point. And especially if you look at the look at the, the top the top albums at that time, you've got stuff like The Strokes, Queens of the Stone Age. So how they kinda of went under the radar just because the press maybe just uh, were were looking for something different. And the Teenage Fan Club have got a loyal uh, fan base and it, I'm sure it sold decent numbers and it, like you say, eh, it did go under the radar quite a bit at that point and it is a good album, definitely. And I, and I think, having spoken to Paul, it sounded as though the record company weren't getting behind it. It was something that they were contracted to put out after Sony bought Creation. So they put the album out but they maybe didn't market it as well as they would have done if they were 100% behind it. Fashions change, eh? And so do fads and record companies are all... At that point, the rec- Sony were maybe looking for the next strokes. They were maybe looking for another band like Queens of the Stone Age. The Libertines would have been kicking about at that point as well. So they're, they're, they're looking for guys with skinny jeans and look like they come from New York rather than four guys from Bells Hill. There's going to be some mentions of albums that if the listeners haven't heard them, go out and stream them, download them. You're going to have some time to reacquaint yourself with music from the year 2000. And here's a few before we go into two or three albums that we'll focus on a wee bit more. PJ Harvey, Stories from the City, Stories from the Sea. We also had Granddaddy, The Software Slump, and Lamb Chop with Nixon, Yola Tango, and then Nothing Turned Itself Inside Out, and Elliot Smith with Figure 8. So go out and check those albums out. And if you're a fan of A Celtic State of Mind and you like some of the music that Kevin and I talk about, I'm sure you'll enjoy all of those albums, but another one which at the time I remember going and seeing him, he had left the Verve and he brought out his first solo record alone with everybody, which uh, obviously I'm speaking about Richard Ashcroft. I've heard interviews fairly recently where he says that Urban Hymns would have been his first solo record, which is a bit of a, for me, it's a wee bit of a slight on the work done by the other band members and in particular Nick McCabe. But what was your thoughts and what have been your thoughts on Richard Ashcroft's Solo output, Kevin. His first one, his first album's really good. The first two are set quite a high watermark for him. But then, since that point, they have been patchy. Apart from his last two. His last two have probably been the best since the first two. Again, sometimes with Richard, as you've already pointed out, when he when he claims that Urban Hymns should have been his first solo album, well, I, I kind of disagree with that. Uh, I don't think Urban Hymns would have been Urban Hymns if out Nick McCabe and the rest of the boys on it, uh, giving it that sonic kick, which some of his solo stuff seems to miss. I've seen him live quite a few times uh, doing the solo stuff, and it gets a bit ponderous at times, especially when him and his band try to be the Verve and try to go into these elongated jams, which the Verve in the mid-90s 
were absolutely fantastic at Life's an Ocean, uh, Stormy Clouds. The, the songs that really grabbed you and sucked you in. I mean, there's no doubt about it, Richard Ashcroft is a fantastic songwriter. He's got a sound, he has got a sound. That gets sort of, what could you say, for those more snobbish, they say, oh, it's Neil Diamond. Well, if you didn't like a bit of Neil Diamond, they're sucking up with you. And I can I can get where people are coming from. You, you're talking about a guy who's a songwriter, who's wrote Bittersweet Symphony, who's wrote The Drugs Don't Work, who wrote a number of Verve B-sides eh, around the time of A Northern Soul, which are some of the greatest songs ever written, but they ended up on B-sides because the band sort of imploded at the time. And his solo stuff is good. There's some gems, especially on that alone with everybody in the, in the next album after it. There's some absolute gems on both those solo albums and also his recent ones. He seems like a decent lad. Uh, he likes his cars. Celtic uh, man. Decent. He was a, seemingly a decent footballer as well. Could have played for Man United. Uh, I think he had a trial with Man United when he was when he was younger. He seems a decent lad, as I say. He likes his cars, likes his trainers. He sells himself that he knows that he's a good songwriter and he's not he's not afraid to say it. And I, I think that rubs people up the wrong way. He's, he's quite willing to show the trappings of success. He's quite willing to go. I've got I've got a nice looking wife. I've got a I've got a nice looking vintage car. I've got great so, hair. He still looks extremely skinny, even though he's got about fifteen t-shirts on. I think he rubs people up the wrong way, and his music is maybe harshly judged because of that, rather than folk judging his music for what it actually is at times. I love Richard Ashcroft. I think his finest lyric is "I stand accused just like you for being born." without a silver spoon, which was on the front cover of This Is Music. He's standing there with a sandwich board. What a cover. Brian Cannon from Mike the Dot designed it. And just fairly recently, at the release of one of his recent albums, Richard Ashcroft was bouncing about with a gas mask on. He looked like Richard out of Dead Man's Shoes. Maybe he knew something that we didn't in advance because I don't have a gas mask. I've got a baseball bat right enough, which might come in handy. And one of the, the songs that goes... Under the Radar was from Richard Ashcroft's 2010 album United Nations of Sound. It was released under RPA, Richard Paul Ashcroft and the United Nations of Sounds. And one of the songs on that album, actually it's a very enjoyable album, Kevin. I don't know if it's one you've got into, but there's a song on there called This Thing Called Life. When you listen to it on the album, it's probably produced wrong or maybe overproduced. But when you hear him doing it in a live setting or acoustically, it's up there, it's up there with the the kind of output that he was that he was producing uh, when they were at their peak of their powers with the Verve. To be honest, you know. So this thing called life is that a song you're aware of? I do know it. Again, it wasn't f- one of my favourite albums. It just seemed to be like Richard Ashcroft on steroids. That album, eh? He just seemed to take a. He seemed to become for me. He just seemed to like become this parody. Richard Ashcroft. How can I say it? It's basically like Frank McAvenny being Jonathan Watson's Frank McAvenny. Richard Ashcroft became the music press's Richard Ashcroft around about that period, and they seem to be playing a character. And maybe my view of the album is tainted by that a bit. Possibly, possibly. What I would say then, for anybody who agrees with you, is just log on to YouTube, type in this thing called Life, Richard Ashcroft and the Roots, and what you'll get is you'll get a version of that song that Richard Ashcroft played live on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon because the house band obviously was the roots at that time and it's a spectacular performance of what I think is just a brilliant song which has kind of been lost on that album in many ways for a lot of Richard Ashcroft and their fans. So that was Richard Ashcroft on his solo trip. Some of the other albums, Radiohead released Kid A. I know that Radiohead fans are so fanatical. I'm more of a, a Benz fan, and I don't know if that, that is me just going for the more kind of crafted songs. I thought that was a fantastic album. What's your thoughts on Radiohead? I've never got Radiohead. I've tried a number of times in many of the different guises, and I just can't get into them at all. I don't know what it is. I just... Them and the Cortinas seem to be two bands that people go, you'll love them, you'll love them. And when I actually sit down and listen to them, I just don't get it. So you've tried? You've tried the Radiohead, yeah? I've I've tried, yes. Because I'm a big fan, as I say, I remember Pablo Honey because of the obvious Creep single that came out. 
But I was I was more into the bands and I loved OK Computer as well. Thought that was a fantastic album, very challenging. They they actually challenged themselves, I think, in that album. And since then, every album they've brought out has been very much lauded by the music press. And Kid A uh, was one of those albums. But that was released in two thousand. Again, you have given them a you've given them a listen, Kevin. Perhaps during these isolated times, you will go back to Radiohead. I do think there's a there's a right good few albums in there, personally, although I'm not a massive Radiohead fan. And the other two albums before we get to the main event, first of all, Badly Drawn Boy, The Hour of Bewilderbeast. Now, that is relevant because Jimmy Goodwin and co. played on that album. They were Damon Goff's backing band for a lot of the songs on that album. Were you aware of that? Yes, I was. I love the, the cover. I love the cover art. Of the Hour of Bewilder Beast, I thought it was fantastic. It was designed by Andy Votel. That's right. And uh, mm-hmm. I really, really loved the cover art of uh, that particular album. And obviously, people will know Andy Votel from Twisted Nerve Records. But Badly Drawn Boy used members of, I say used, he was accompanied or he collaborated with members of Doves and also a band called Alfie. Can you remember them? Yes, I do. Um, I saw Alfie at King Tut's. So did I. Back in the day. So did I. The guy was sitting down on a bit on a, a stool. That's right. For almost I... the entire gig. Yes, that's right. You were correct, at the same I... gig. We didn't even know. I know. Didn't even know. I've got the ticket somewhere. There wasn't really that many folk there, if I remember correctly. I was. I was. A... The lead singer was a guy called Lee Gorton. He looked a wee bit, a wee bit like a kind of stockier Ian Brown, if I remember right. Well, I, I was going to say a, a sort of stockier Rick Witter, if I'm, Rick Witter. If I'm picturing the right guy. I think I'm still Yeah, they're all kind of Simeon. They've got Simeon features, haven't they? Definitely, aye. There's Ian definitely. Brown, Rick Witter, Lee Gorton, yeah. The, 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 so there you go, we were we were at the same, we were in the same room and we didn't even know it. There we go, eh? <laughs> so Alfie, Alfie played on this album. What was your thoughts on the hour of Bewilderbeast? For me, it's the finest album that Damon Goff's ever produced. It was the album that introduced me to the twisted, whimsical, fantastic world of Badly Drawn Boy. We're talking about guys being characters and Badly Drawn Boy is definitely Damon Goff's alter ego. Again, a lot of, you mentioned Alfie at that time and you mentioned and this album as well. There's a sort of folkiness about it, about Manchester at that point, mm-hmm. especially with pop sensibilities as well. And, I mean, that album was a breakthrough album for Badly Drum Boy, then he went on to do the soundtrack for About A Boy, which has probably set him up for life. I, again, he was just one of the guys, he, he just seemed to be a, an anti-rock star, anti-pop star, where you've had the late 90s, where everybody was trying to be Oasis and trying to be rock and roll and trying to have look like football hooligans. You had these guys that suddenly appear which just, who just look like normal Joes who let their music do their talking rather than <laughs> rather than their antics rather than saying oh we've done this we've done that they've just gone here's a record listen to it it's great and yeah. I, th- I think I think that, that that's good and on the other hand as well I mean I mentioned the Strokes and Queens of the Stone Age and that eh? I mean the Strokes look like one of the most rock and roll bands that you'll ever get and so the Queens of the Stone Age but at that time I mean some of the albums that that you've mentioned here, you can see that there's a balance. There's a, there's a lot of singer songwriters. There's a lot of nice solo stuff there, and there's a lot of hard edged heavy stuff. So the year two thousand was a bit of a mix. The thing the thing is though, looking back at this, it's it's interesting because I remember being a massive fan of Badly Drawn Boy at that time. I saw one of his absolutely bewildering, to use the correct word, live performances around about that time, and. I'm looking at his uh, back catalogue and I was there for the first four albums. He released four albums in four years. The Hour of Bewilder Beast, About a Boy, Have You Fed the Fish and One Plus One is One. After that, he fell away really from my radar. I've never listened to a single album since then. So again, I might go back, I might have a listen to his last five albums. He released an album this year, Kevin, that I wasn't even aware of until speaking to you right now. So it's always a good way of going back retrospectively and, and picking up because he's a songwriter and there's bound to be songs and albums within the last five releases that I would enjoy. The other album, of course, I know you're a big fan, Primal Scream, Exterminator. I mentioned this on uh, the podcast with Ace City Racers, that it's very unusual for a band to have one 
era-defining album. Never mind have two ten years apart, and this is what the Primal Scream done. I mean, if you listen to if you listen to Scream Adelica, then listen to Exterminator, and you say to somebody, "Is that done by the same band?" They're likely to go, "No, that's two different bands." Yeah, they, they seem to Scream Adelica capture the end of Acid House, and Exterminator completely captures the confused, violent nature of the the new millennium where we didn't know what was going to happen and the, the political themes on that album are still very relevant today and I read a, a, I read a article in The Quietus and they says it's amazing that you have an album that's 20 year old that actually predicted the future of what's actually happening today so mm-hmm. the tribal scheme were political animals at that point and also at that point you've got the production of Kevin Shields you've got Manny who who is then a permanent member of the band and you've got a band at that point that are quite willing musically to take risks and work in a different way and it's a fantastic album it's an utterly fantastic is, album I mean it is Manny, the greatest ever Bosman, the greatest ever musical Bosman signing of all time, from the Stone Roses to Primal Scream. I'm going to throw in, I'm going to throw in a band here and an album because, believe it or not, not because I'm name dropping, but I had this discussion with Bonehead out of Oasis, Coldplay, Parachutes, Discuss. Oh, can I swear? Can I really, really swear? Um, there's albums at that time that were massive. And when I says a couple of moments ago regarding albums that don't stand up well when you go back to listen to them and that you thought they were okay at that time. Parachutes was one of them. I was working uh, in a in a warehouse at this point and we used to listen to Radio 1 and Joe Wiley was a big champion of Coldplay and she used to play them. She played Shiver, she played Yellow. So I bought the album on the back of the, those two. They're two fine songs. They are fine songs. But now there's another one that round about that time which was massive. Travis, the man who as well sold millions upon millions of co- copies. But for me now, when you go back and listen to them, they're, I'm trying to think of the right term here. They're, they're flim- Let it out. Come on, just say it. They're, they're flimsy. They're flimsy albums. There's no substance to them. They're instantly forgettable. They're albums for people who didn't really like music, who will put well, it on. I'll make a point. Guy Berryman, Guy Berryman, who plays, obviously, on that album, or co-play, is still a, a member of the band, was born in Kirkcaldy. So he's a fifer. Uh, Oliver Burke was also born in Kirkcaldy. But listen, <laughs> I've got an interview on film, in me and Bonehead, and we speak about this album. He brought it up. I didn't bring it up. That film still exists. I'm going to dig that out. That's going to go up on the Celtic State of Mind YouTube channel eventually. Once I dig it out, it's about a one hour interview with Bonehead. And we speak about everything from Pretty Green to Liam Gallagher's forthcoming album at that time. And Bonehead knew the name of the band. He wouldn't tell me. It was it was uh, obviously BDI. And we spoke about Definitely Maybe. We spoke about all of that. And it's a great interview. I would look at it's on a disc, I'm going to dig it out, it's going to go up on the YouTube channel. Before we get to the final album we're going to discuss today, Kevin, Celtic State of Mind set up a studio just a couple of weeks ago, it's been called the Number 7 Studio, and we were producing daily podcasts in that studio, and if I don't say so myself, they were to an extremely high quality in terms of sound, and obviously because there's been a few things happened in the last few days, we're now in isolation. I'm recording this at my kitchen table, you are probably in your spare bedroom, and we're putting this together as best as technology will allow under the circumstances. So I'm still using the same sound equipment that I was using in the studio but obviously the source of guests could be, for example, yourself. You're recording straight into one of our old dictaphones that we used to use on the road, Kevin. Um, but there's going to be occasions where I can only capture mobile phone technology. It's coming through Bluetooth straight into the mixing desk. And I can only treat that as much as possible to try and put out daily podcasts which, by the way, are all free of charge. So if anybody comes on to our social media channels, and mentions the sound quality. I hope they do appreciate the fact that there is only so much you can do with a phone call, and I would much rather have the interview than not. Now, I had the same kind of feedback, if you want to call it that, 
when I interviewed Ronnie Dyler, who was in Norway, but unfortunately I didn't have the finances to go and see him in Norway. I interviewed Paddy McCourt, who was in Northern Ireland. These are the things that you're going to have to accept over the next few weeks and months, Kevin. Podcasts are largely free, and if you're going to interview somebody, it's better having the interview, even if it's over the phone, than not. Surely the content is better than not having it. Definitely, and there's so many variables when uh, when you're doing this, and there's so many technical things that can go wrong. I mean, we've tried a number of ways. We've tried trying to do it over internet connections using different software, and it all depends on whoever you're interviewing or where you are. Internet, how strong it is, how good it is. You do want the content, and we all want the content. And I would rather be sitting in the room with you talking direct because because it feels sometimes it feels like the conversation flows better because you can see the person and it does it's more social it gives it, it gives it more a conversational vibe but sometimes you have to go over the telephone and I sometimes listen to podcasts that are highly rated and the sound quality is rubbish and they do them over telephones. But understand why, if, if you're in different parts of the world, and at this point we're all going to be in different parts of the world, we're all going to be in our own, yeah. uh, we're all going to be, as the train guy says, do, do, have, you, have you watched the Bob Mortar or been the train guy? I have, I. So, it's, brilliant. It's, it's hilarious, it's absolutely hilarious. So, at this precise moment, moment in time when we're all in our isolation, inspiration stations, to, to quote one of his catchphrases, we're, we're going to need to get round this somehow, but it isn't going to be what we usually produce. And we just need to accept that. We just try to make it as best as we can, as enjoyable as we can. But let's not beat about the bush when we're out of this. The sound quality is going to be what it always is. It's going to be top notch. And there's football clubs out there who have got independent fan media, which are all subscription based. And they're doing stuff over Skype, they're doing stuff over the telephone, they're doing stuff as best as they actually can. And really, at this at this time, get on board with it. It doesn't matter what it sounds like, get on board with it. The content's great. I listened to the interview, the first one that you done on the phone, and for me, it wasn't actually that bad. I've heard worse. Recently, I have heard worse. So, I, again, we just need to get on with it. There's not much we can do. And it's better to have that content. We're in the bunker. We're in an underground situation. You know, it's like pirate radio at this moment in time. We're all doing it from different edges of the country and hopefully from different edges of the planet. And we will continue to produce daily podcasts. What we're going to do moving forward through this period, Kevin, is we're going to have designated guests on each particular day. Your Scream Acelica feature will be on the same day every single week. So get working on the next one. And that takes us up to the album of choice. It's Doves. We've spoken a lot about Doves. Jimmy Goodwin got me into the garage for a sold out gig when they were just about to release their second album. I love the band. I don't think they've ever produced a bad album. Sub Sub. They came from the remnants of Sub Sub. Ain't no use. And they're a very important band actually for me when I look back on my life. I just think... Everything they've produced has been excellent and I hope they are working on a new album. This album, when when I knew I was going to record this, so I've been dipping back in and I will go back, probably, I probably will try to listen to Radiohead again and I probably will try and listen to the uh, Battle Drum Boy Hopefully. again. I'm not going that far, mate, not going that far. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Badly Drum Boy. But so yesterday morning, I'm trying to keep myself in a routine, obviously, I'm I'm not at work. So I get up early in the morning and I go down the stairs to go on the, go the treadmill. So I open my back doors to go out into the garden. And it's very, it's very weird. At that time in the morning, there is a silence. But the silence now that you're hearing is, seem, feels completely different. It feels like there's a, there's a fear in this silence rather than just a peaceful silence. So mm-hmm. I was thinking about that when I put this album on, when I put on Lost Souls again. And maybe because I'm listening to it through the, the prism of the current uncertainty, which is actually here, it sounded completely different from what I remembered it. Uh, for the last time that I listened to it, previously I thought it was a fantastic guitar album. But see, when I listened to it yesterday morning, and I actually listened to it 
again this morning. It's a fantastic, it's a soul album. It's a, it's got such soul, soul in depth, and the vocals from the whole band. There's a fragility in the vocals that make it a soul album. A lot of folk think a soul album's got to be, you know what I mean, fantastic production, fantastic singing. But I think soul also has to have a vulnerability. And this album is a vulnerable album. It sounds distant, but the songs on it, the songs on it, I mean, you've got uh, Here It Comes, The Sea Song, Rise, Melody Calls, The Man Who Told Everything, and, like, The Cedar Room. They're, they're big, big songs. And I mentioned Coldplay and you mentioned, I mentioned Travis. No, today, big music, big, simple music, which appeals to the masses, is extremely difficult. Yeah. And doves do it. They have that knack of doing something so sparse and so simple and doing it extremely well. And it's very easy to fail if you're trying to make something sound simple and sparse. Also on that album, it sounds extremely claustrophobic. And I think that's when you speak to the band or you read interviews with the band, they actually say it's because of the studio that they recorded it in, in Cheatham Hill, which was New Order Studio, and there was no windows and it was black. It was it was really it was really quite dark for them. And I think you can feel that claustrophobia on it, but there's also a sense of hope and a wide open space of the songs on that album. At the time, the reviews says it was a post party come down album and mm -hmm. That that was, that's maybe a bit too simplistic, but you can actually feel there's a lot of mel melancholy in the album, but there's also a lot of hope. So for me, that's what makes it a great soul album. Again, it could have just been where we are in the world at this point, but I found it really, really more uplifting than listening to it all those years ago, and the last time that I listened to it as well. It just took a different. It just took a different glow yesterday morning yeah. and, and yeah. this morning eh? so it's really quite weird for me to revisit that at this point and come to a completely different conclusion than if you would have asked me four or five weeks ago well this is the thing we're in we're in uncharted waters Kevin and I think when you think of art literature, movies, music they are going to take a different form under the circumstances in which we are currently living when I look at that particular album I think back to the atmospheric Nature of the Cedar Room. It was written about a ghost. It was written about a, a, a spirit. Fantastic song, video. And then you compare it with a song like Catch the Sun. Catch the Sun almost stands out among the rest of the, the songs on that album. And it's interesting that it was actually produced and mixed by Steve Osborne. I know you'll be more than familiar with due to the work that he's done with bands like Happy Mondays, Suede and others. But I think that particular song stands out. It's a wee bit different and I think it's probably the production, but it's it's a standout single on that album, isn't it? Catch the Sun. But one thing I would say as well for anybody listening, because again, just sharing my own kind of thoughts on a lot of these bands is take a listen to some of the, the B-sides that were coming out at that time. They did eventually re release a B-sides album, but two in particular from that album were Valley, which I think was on the Catch the Sun single, and Your Shadow Lay Across My Life, two outrageously good songs that didn't make it onto the album. But back then, that's what bands were doing. That's what Teenage Fan Club, The Smiths, Oasis, The Verve, The Charlatans, and Doves, that's what they did. They put out phenomenal B-sides. So listen to those, those B-sides. Kevin, it's been an absolute pleasure to hear your memories of some of the fantastic albums that came out in that era, 2000, and in particular your description of Lost Souls. It was poetic, as it always is with yourself. Have a wee think about the, the album we're going to do next week. We'll reconvene this conversation next week and we'll choose a different album from a different year. And until then, Kevin, take care of yourself. Thanks very much, Paul. Hail, hail. 